Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Friday, the 5th of October, 2012. I'm Jim Ninsel, host of Political Roundtable, our weekly analysis and commentary on local, state, and national politics. Tonight on the Roundtable, we'll discuss a tightening U.S. Senate race between Republican Jeff Flake and Democrat Richard Carmona, and look at the new ads in the race between Congressman Ron Barber and his Republican challenger, Martha McSally. We'll also look at the legal trouble that Attorney General Tom Horn is facing and discuss the tragic death of another border agent. Joining me this evening is Pima County Democratic Cha Party Chairman Jeff Rogers, Tucson Tea Party founder Trent Humphreys, and Tucson City Councilman Steve Kasachik. Thanks to all of you for being here. Trent, the presidential debate this week, I think uh, the Republicans are very happy with the performance of Mitt Romney in that particular uh, go round. Well, I think so. I think it was the first time for the voters to actually break through you know, what the media says about the candidates or what the commercials say about the candidates and actually see the candidates interact with one another. And I think, I'm thinking that uh, the, the big problem we had is you know, Mitt Romney prepared. He had his facts and everything in line. And it looked like Barack Obama just showed up. You know, it didn't, he, he uh, went off, he winged it. And you can't do that. Things are way too important to do that. And I think it showed, and I think that a lot of people were very, very disappointed in the, in the, in the performance of the president. Jeff? Well, I, I wasn't pleased with the performance of the president, but on the other hand, uh, when you have someone who's so untethered to the truth and the facts, like Romney is, who's basically willing to, as, as uh, thinkprogress.org said, uh, uh, he told 27 lies in 38 minutes of talking. I think that's a lie about every 90 seconds, um, all the way from the, the constant lie that we hear often from the, the chair, not this man, but from this chair often, uh, about the $716 million cuts in Medicare. You know, he told that lie four times, and the president didn't call him out on it. I mean, we all know, because we've studied this, that, that that's, those aren't cuts, that those were agreed upon uh, cuts in, in payments to providers, not in benefits, but agreed upon by those providers, hospitals, and insurance companies, uh, because they understand understood they would still get more money because of the mandate. And so those were savings that were even included in Paul Ryan's plan. And not once did the president jump up and say, you know, look, you know, you can't completely keep telling this lie and it suddenly become the truth. And then you add to that the other myriad of false statements that he made that are demonstrably false. Uh, for instance, denying he has a $5 trillion uh, a tax cut. Well, a 20% tax rate over the next 10 cut across the board over the next 10 years is $4.8 trillion. And so now uh, we know that, and he's never denied that until, of course, the other night when he just came out full of nothing but lies. And, uh, and then Romney says, oh, but I'm going to somehow backfill that by filling in uh, the uh, uh, deductions and loopholes. Well, the, the, the policy, Tax Policy Institute has, has studied that and said, look, when we, when we do that, you can't get anywhere close to, to making this revenue neutral unless you go all the way down to middle class people and cut their mortgage deductions. So, you know, he, he's just such a dishonest candidate. I think in, in some respects he may be the most dishonest candidate, Romney, in, uh, uh, in the history of presidential elections. I mean, everything he, this morning on the, on the way over here, I'm listening to the radio, and he says, oh, that 7.8% uh, uh, jobless number, which is, seems like such wonderful news, it's not really good news because it, so many people dropped out of the labor force. Well, no, that happens occasionally, and last month's jobless rate showed that that, that was occurring, but not this time. This time, they said quite clearly that this was people getting jobs, not discouraged workers not looking anymore. So, I mean, he can't help, but, but it, it's like, how do you know he's lying? And he opens his mouth and talks. All right, Steve, uh, the, <laughs> quite an act to follow there, but uh, it, it, does this have an impact, I think, on, on possibly the lower level races? Well, perhaps. Maybe they should have cloned uh, Jeff to stand in the president's <laughs> place that night because clearly he shows more passion in this last couple of minutes than the president did during the 90 minutes debate. Romney clearly won on style as to substance. I'm not sure how deeply into the weeds most of the voters are going to get in terms of looking at the $5 billion or the $700 billion for the uh, Medicare uh, cuts or whatever they are, those numbers are. You know, think back, though, to the, uh, to the 1980 Kerry-Bush debates. You know, Kerry cleaned Bush's clock in the first debate. There are two more to go, plus there's a vice presidential debate. So there's a lot of, a lot of, um, of this race yet to run. In terms of the, uh, the down-ticket races, I'm not sure. It might, it might energize uh, some of the Republican base. Quite frankly, before uh, whatever night it was the debate was on, I would have said that Obama's base likes him better than um, Romney's base likes him. Maybe that up, ups the, uh, up the uh, likability factor for, uh, for uh, candidate Romney 
as opposed in comparison to Obama's base now. So it might energize some of them, uh, but I think that they, each of the races are going to kind of stand on their own merits. And Trent, what do you think? The down ticket races, some some momentum now on the well, I, GOP I, I side. I think so. I think there's because of the because of uh, the debate for one. You know, I, Obama would have been better sending the chair. That would have been better for him. But I mean, let, let's talk about Ohio. Ohio was basically the election. Whatever happens in Ohio is the way it's going to go. If we look at the early uh, absentee ballots right now, last uh, four uh, four years ago. Uh, they had 33% uh, of the ballots returned were from Democrats or, or the requested, and 19 were from Republicans, 19%. Uh, this year, it's 29%, down four points for Democrats, and it's 24%, up five points for Republicans. And if, if that holds true, if that holds up through the whole, the whole early balloting process, Romney's going to win by, by a comfortable margin. Let's talk about one of the, well, you know, let, let's talk about one of these down ticket races, in particular the uh, the U.S. Senate race here in uh, Arizona between Richard Carmona and Jeff Flake. It does seem as though polls have shown that tightening. We had a, a public policy polling poll this week that showed uh, Carmona in the lead for first time by two points. But even last week we saw polls that showed a, a two or three point race, and and you had Chuck Coughlin, who's the governor's. Uh, uh, advisor on many issues saying he believes this race is getting much tighter and it's a question of who can close at this point and we've seen some back and forth in that race. Uh, uh, Richard Carmona is going after Jeff Flake on veterans issues uh, and, and Flake's returning fire on, on issues of whether or not uh, Richard Carmona uh, divested himself of his tobacco stock at the same time he was discouraging people uh, from smoking and, and I think the latest thing is over uh, Carmona's management of the Pima County health care system down here. Where, where do you see this race at this point? Well, I, I mean, there's several polls. I mean, Rasmussen had, what, seven points? Six or seven Six points. Six or seven yeah. points, and that was a week ago or so. Well, you know, where I think we're at is, is that uh, I think that, you know, look, the, the, the dead bottom of the Democrat, you're, any Democrat that runs is going to get 30, you know, 35 percent. That's what, that's what Rodney got. And I think that's the, I think we can all agree that's the exact floor of what you can get as a Democrat here. And for Carmona to be doing, you know, five, ten, you know, ten points better than that, I think that's probably to be expected because he's going to do a little bit better than that. Now the question is, can he can he close the deal on what, all the rest of the voters? Now, acor even according to the PPP poll, a vast majority of the people remaining that are undecided are going to cast a ballot for Mitt Romney. So that's that's a big that's a big ticket for Carmona to overcome. And Steve, your sense of where this race is well, going? Well, good point? luck in pivoting uh, Flake back to the center after he ran as far to the right as he could during the primary against Cardin. Uh, the more people uh, learn about Richard Carmona, the more they're gravitating towards him. You know, even when he won the uh, uh, endorsement of the Goldwater family, the Goldwater family came out and said, this state's Republican Party has lurched so far to the right that Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater wouldn't have a home in it right now. Uh, Rich Carmona is respected throughout the uh, southern Arizona area. He is focusing on Mar the Maricopa County area right now. Uh, also, good luck in trying to equate uh, votes against veterans benefits versus having a broker go and make a couple of uh, stock picks that you had to back him away from. Those don't have any kind of comparison at all in, in terms of people's minds with respect to the, the importance in terms of their vote. I think Carmona is going to continue to uh, improve his, uh, his standing, and I think he's going to uh, prevail on this. Goldwater has a big family. Let's be sure about that. His one daughter is endorsed Carmona. And a granddaughter. Granddaughter. Granddaughter does not equal the, the Carmona. No, and a daughter. A, a, and but, a daughter. But I think the comment that they made is really important, it and is. that is that, that neither Barry Goldwater nor Ronald Reagan would have a home in this state's Republican Party. That speaks volumes, and, and frankly, I think people listen to that, and I think it's going to matter. Yeah, we, we waived the Democratic Party rules to allow uh, uh, her to be announce our votes on the convention floor in Charlotte, and she said the same thing there, that, that, that they, you wouldn't recognize, they wouldn't recognize this party. Um, I think Carmona's in a situation where, where, where Flake looks at him and sees it, he's like a fully loaded freight train rolling downhill. I mean, he has momentum on his side. Coughlin said as much in his uh, uh, interviews about it. Um, and, and I think that's why Flake finally decided to quit being a coward and come out and debate him and agree to televised debates. So now we're going to see three televised debates. And uh, I, I, I think that's why 
why Flake agreed to do it, and people were going to get to know him. And also, he, he raised $2.2 million in this last quarter, in the third quarter of the year. There's been no Democrat ever in the history of Arizona to raise that much in, in one quarter for a statewide race. I mean, that's extraordinary. And, uh, and he's still got a lot of money on hand. So I just, I really do think when you, when you look at those polls, when you look at that, when, when you look at the fact that his favorability ratings in the polls are very high, his unfavorable is very low, whereas Flake is almost tied with favorability and unfavorability. So, And then when you look at the fact that there are still people out there who don't know who Rich Carmona is. And so as Steve was saying, if he can just introduce himself to people, they, they quickly say, well, yeah, I'm for that guy, not, that, not the other guy. So it's, well, the debates begin next Wednesday, and uh, well, I'm sure we'll be able to discuss them next week. But uh, down here in southern Arizona, the Congressional District 2 race between Congressman Ron Barber and Martha McSally is heating up this week. You had the House Majority Pack, which supports Democrats, come in and, and start an ad this week. Uh, you had the Republican National uh, Congressional Committee announce that they're going to start running an ad this week. Uh, Jim Colby has come out and endorsed Martha McSally. Uh, we had two polls in this race, one showing Ron Barber with a 14-point a lead, which seems very high to me. Uh, another one from the McSally campaign showing them tied. Uh, let's take a look at an ad here uh, from uh, the the House Majority Pack. Wall Street and Martha McSally. Here's what they've got cooking. McSally wants to privatize Social Security and turn it over to Wall Street, where investors have already lost millions. McSally even supports raising the retirement age, and her Washington backers passed a plan to essentially end Medicare. McSally and Wall Street, a recipe for disaster and a plan that seniors just can't swallow. House Majority PAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. All right, so that advertisement uh, launched earlier this week. Uh, the McSally campaign has complained that it's a very sexist ad with the whole recipe idea. And then we also had uh, a KVOA actually pulled the ad down this week after complaints from the McSally campaign that she does not support Social Security privatization and, and claims that the ad is false. Then we have a second ad actually from the uh, from uh, the McSally campaign featuring Congressman uh, or former Congressman Jim Colby uh, defending him. So uh, let's take a look at that defending uh, Martha McSally. Let's take a look at that one. I saw Ron Barber unfairly attack my friend Martha McSally. He's wrong. McSally earned her stripes in the Air Force. She's the first woman ever to lead combat missions. Ron Barber doesn't understand. Southern Arizona is different. We have a history of electing leaders to Congress who don't fall in lockstep with the party. Martha McSally fits right in line with us in Southern Arizona. That's why she'll make a great Congresswoman. I'm Martha McSally and I approve this message. All right, Jeff, Jim Colby is a good get, I think, for Martha McSally. Well, I think race. so. I like Jim, and I think he's well-liked across the, the broad spectrum of politics here in, in, in southern Arizona. Um, but let me back up for a moment on the polling that we talked about. Um, that recent polling was done by Lisa Grove and Associates. I've used Lisa Grove down here on local elections. She's polled this area many times for us in congressional campaigns, city campaigns, and uh, I found her polling to be f very accurate. The one that shows Barbara yes, had by and, and so, so given who did it and her familiarity with this area, area, I'd say it's a very troubling poll, whereas the poll by McSally, which shows her tied, is done for, by an agency that's famous for doing push polls. Uh, they were even uh, uh, sued in, I think it's Vermont, where their push polls are illegal. Uh, they're not illegal here, and so uh, uh, that's that probably explains why, how they got to that result there. But yeah, the, 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 the recipe ad here uh, is not a barber campaign. You can't coordinate. That's against the law. Tom Horn found that out. Um, so uh, you... Uh, uh, so it wouldn't be my first pick of a way to run a commercial against her. But I think that one of the salient things I take away from McSally is of all of her commercials, we don't hear her talk about one issue. She talks about her, her resume and her history. She never talks about what she stands for. And that's because during those debates as to who was more, more conservative than, than who in the primaries, especially in the primaries for the special election, there wasn't a dime's worth of difference between those candidates. And she even said something like that. In one of the debates, I think she said something, well, we're preaching to the choir, we all agree on, on these issues. So, you know, that puts her in, a, in quite a predicament because she's basically said, I'm Jesse Kelly in a skirt. And Trent, uh, you've expressed some skepticism about, about uh, Martha McSally's uh, chances on this program well, before, I, I but you are seeing... I the... think that was, that was powerful right there. I think that was a huge misstep 
you know, by, by whoever put that ad out. That was a bad thing to do, I think. And I think that bringing Colby in there to defend, defend her, it, that, that was, that was a, a smart move. And I think, I think that that'll win votes. I'm not sure if it'll be enough, but I, I guarantee you, in fact, I'll, I'll put money on the table right now. It's not going to be a 14-point victory. I, I wouldn't take that spread either. Uh, <laughs> Steve, either Steve you've, you've crossed party lines yeah, to support the, Ron Barber. In this yeah, the, uh, the first ad was, was, you look at the disclaimer, it was not a Ron Barber ad. You know, we, we know about independent campaigns, so right. that you can't ascribe that to him. But let's look at Mark, Martha McSally in that second ad. Uh, when uh, she, uh, she has come out verbal, uh, vocally uh, in support of the Ryan budget, which did uh, talk about privatizing Medicare. Uh, she says that the education has, uh, federal government has no role in education. Uh, she has said that it, with respect to abortion, uh, she does not support abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. She sounds like Jesse Kelly uh, to me, uh, redux, and I think that, uh, she, that Ron is going to continue to move up in the polls as people recognize uh, that she is about as far to the right as you can get, and uh, that does not reflect the, uh, the ethos of this community. All right. I, I want to steer away from politics for a moment and, and address this uh, Border Patrol shooting. Uh, we had a Border Patrol agent, Nicholas Ivey, killed on the, investigating a, uh, a tripped sensor on the border this week, uh, and one of his colleagues also wounded in that. And uh, there's under investigation, there's some question about the possibility, we, we don't know, but the, the, the possibility of friendly fire in this particular situation, but we, we, we don't know the facts yet. Uh, Steve, your thoughts on, on what's happening here? Okay, first of all, our Border Patrol agents deserve all, all the support and all the kudos and all the thanks um, that we can give them as a community. You know, we can sit up here in this kind of sterile environment uh, and rec not recognize the fact that those men and women who go out every night are going walking into a, a war zone. Uh, the, the fact of the matter, though, is that we have increased in the last 10 years our number of Border Patrol agents from just under 10,000 to just under 20,000. We still have a $40 billion drug trade uh, problem across the border. To simply say, such as Martha McSally has said, that we just need to build a block wall and militarize the border really ignores the fact that our third largest trading partner is on the other side of that border. It ignores the fact that tens of thousands of Mexican citizens are being caught in the crossfire of this drug war. Ron Barber has said, and, and so has Rich Carmona, frankly, that we need to nurture and expand our relationship with the Mexican government, help them economically, work out the social relationships that are, that are on the, cro on the, uh, on the uh, border towns that really are, are catching their citizens in the crossfire. You cannot focus simply on militarizing the border and simply and, and feel that that's going to solve this problem. Our border patrol agents are doing yeoman's work for us, but it's bigger, it's a much more complex issue than simply saying militarize the border. We have an extremely important trading partner in the Mexican government, and we need to nurture that relationship. Trent, your thoughts? Well, I'm not going to go ahead and politicize this like Steve just did. I'm going to go ahead and say, that, look, this is a good man. He's a tremendous man. He's, he's, he's a pillar of the community down there in Sierra Vista, you know, and, uh, and he has, you know, two young children. And, and I think we need, sometimes we need to take the time off from our political hats and say, you know, thank you for your service and what can we do to help those people so they don't have to go through this again. Why, why are we outgunned consistently? Why do we have horseback patrol out there? We could, we could do more. And, uh, we have horseback patrol out there because of the nature of the terrain. That's true. You know, well, well, then, well, then why do you say that? I'm well, not, politi it was a, it was I'm a not politicizing. You, you went the, right to the... Excuse the, the, me. I'm not politicizing it by pointing out the importance of establishing and nurturing a relationship with the Mexican government. That is a fact. That, that is an economic fact, and that is something that we have to... All the candidates... You turned this all, into attack against all of against the, all of the Mark candidates. McSally. All of the candidates recognize that we need, to, we need to increase border security. I agree with that. We need to go one step further than that. That's the political argument. We need to go one step further than that. This is an economic, it is a social, and it is an international relations issue, and that's where we need to get in this. Well, <clears throat> I, the only thing more tragic than this man losing his life is if it did happen from friendly fire. I mean, you know, the, the other agents will just, you know, it, 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 it will compound the tragedy. So, uh, but, but it just goes to show you that the most secure this border has been in the history of the United States is now. And even now, with that kind of security, um, People are adamant on, on getting drugs and sometimes human smuggling through that border. And it's not, uh, it's, it's going to be a problem that, that we have to deal with in a lot of other ways. As Steve said, there are, so we've got to address some of these social issues. And, uh, and some of that enforcement has to come from the other side of the border so that these people don't, don't cross in the first place. I just want to 
our condolences, I think, from Absolutely. all of the roundtable to uh, Nicholas Ivey's family. Uh, in federal court this week, the Justice Department weighed in on a lawsuit regarding the constitutionality of a law passed by the state legislature this last uh, session regarding whether or not federal funds that pass for the state could go to Planned Parenthood for health care services outside of abortion, such as cancer screenings and birth control services and things of that nature. Uh, the state's saying it can do this. The federal government's saying it can't, and there, there are other uh, parties involved in this lawsuit. But, um, Jeff, your thoughts on, on how this case is shaping up? Well, it, it, the Texas case is very similar right now, and it's a little farther along. And in that case, they enjoined uh, the state of Texas from preventing people to going to Planned Parenthood. And the reason is because, uh, like like most federal dollars, Medicaid dollars, which are used for access here, they come with some strings attached. And one of those strings is, is, that, is that the people should have the choice of their providers. And so that's the argument in the Texas case where, it, where this was enjoined, and that's the argument being made here. And I think it most certainly will be enjoined for that very reason. But I mean, it's just, you know, th this constant war on women. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, 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 of the Saturday Night Live uh, episode a couple of weeks ago for selling GOP tampons. Because after all, uh, you know, who knows best what to put in a woman's vagina better than the GOP? I mean, it really is getting to be, you know, unbelievable what the GOP is willing to do to interfere with a woman, her right to choose, and her right to make decisions with the input of her doctor. Trent, your thoughts on well, it all how comes this again, I think you made the point is that there comes a point where we need to cut the strings from the federal government telling the states what to do. Now, this may not be the, the case to do that or not, but I think going forward, we need to have more local control of our government. And the federal government's too big, tells us too, what, too much control of our lives. Now, Jeff likes to talk about specific areas, but you know, we, we need to be scared about the government's control in our entire life. And, and I think that there comes a point where we, we elect our, our, our leaders locally and those people that get elected locally, and I think Steve would agree, need to have more control over the way the money's spent. I just love this local control argument that they make when it has to do with the federal government and, 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 and the state or the county or the city. But when it has to do with the state of Arizona and the right-wing Republicans telling Tucson how to govern itself and telling Tucson what it can and cannot do with money, I mean, then they, then they, they don't seem to be interested in local control. I, I think in the past you've you've been critical of the state for stepping in in those. Yeah, areas. I'm a I'm a Tea Party guy. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, your thoughts on this one? You know, look at uh, the, the last people that I want standing in my daughter's delivery room, or even when she's in, even speaking with her OBGYN if she when she becomes pregnant, are luminaries such as Russell Pierce and Frank Antonori and Terry Proud and Lori Klein. That is a decision between her and her husband and her doctor, and I don't want the state of Arizona, uh, whether 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 it's the Republican Party or the Democratic party uh, in invading that uh, that decision. Uh, I agree with Jeff on this one. This this one needs to be uh, uh, left alone and let that uh, decision be made by the, by the people directly involved. All right. We are, as usual, running out of time and a lot left to talk about. But uh, let's quickly address this situation with the Attorney General. Uh, Maricopa County Attorney um, uh, uh, Mon Bill Montgomery has uh, uh, files a case against the Attorney General saying that he illegally coordinated with an independent campaign committee during his run for Attorney General. Uh, Jeff, your thoughts on that? this? Well, and it, this, it's illegal to coordinate between uh, the candidate's campaign, and in his case, he was running out of money. Uh, it was towards the end, and so you can see how it happened, and they have uh, 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 emails and telephone calls, records that they subpoenaed that show that he was communicating with people who, who ran the independent committee at the very exact same time that decisions were made. So it looks like he's got a pretty good case there. Uh, Horn faces a, and, and the committee faces a one and a half million dollar potential fine in this area. But even, even more bizarre is while the FBI was following him to make this case, they, they saw him hook up with a woman uh, in, in, a, in a parking garage and then he drives her car to her home and they go into her residential area, but not before he commits a hit and run accident where he damages a vehicle uh, and then and then leaves the scene and, and hides from it and so you know now that 's just a misdemeanor with property damage, but it is a crime and uh, and, and I, perhaps he was afraid of showing that he was involved in an affair so you know tom horn 's got things going on on a lot of different levels here in, in this case, and I think he 's probably finished politically, uh, which probably works to uh, the Secretary of State's advantage. Tr uh, trouble for, for uh, his I mean, gubernatorial? If, if, he did, if he did the crime, he needs to you know, pay his consequences. And that, the, I mean, government accountability is, is, is key. I mean, if you're, if you're an elected official and you, you do bad things, you need to face the music. 
Steve, I, I want to get to the downtown and the streetcar uh, story in the Morning Daily this week about the troubles that merchants are having down there as this construction drags on. Uh, your thoughts about uh, the, the streetcar construction and, the, and yeah. the troubles of the merchants? Yeah, there are troubles with the merchants, and I'm really uh, concerned about it. The, uh, I had a meeting last week, called a meeting last week, with some of the project managers with the Fourth Avenue Merchants Association. Uh, I've got another one coming up next week with the downtown merchants. Uh, the, there are small businesses down there that are losing tens of thousands of dollars. Now, these are not the Raytheons of the world. These are small businesses that are living on a margin. Uh, it is incumbent on the City of Tucson project management to work with Granite Construction to get those fence lines down, get them out of the way, and get those, get those thoroughfares back open again. Uh, this, is a, this is not a, and I'm kind of tired of hearing some of the local talk show hosts bash on the City Council saying this is the City Council's trolley. This was a voter approved uh, initiative. Now the burden shifts to the general contractor to make sure that this project is phased appropriately in a manner that gets those fence lines out of the way because these merchants are hurting big time. Uh, we're going to try and find a way to try and mitigate some of the damages to them. Uh, frankly, though, uh, one thing that people can do to support those merchants is to go downtown and shop and uh, check into some of the restaurants and visit some of the shops because the, the one way to make a, make a business successful is to support them with your dollars. And Trent, you've been critical of the streetcar project. Well, you know, like I say, it, every time we, we give something to the city to do, we end up with the, with the overpass that has an elevator and three water features. You know, it's the way we manage projects down. That was before Steve came on. Maybe Steve will help do things better. But, you know, it, it, we get the government funding and then we, it, we end up doing so much that we're already 30, 30 million. Is that where we're at? 30 million dollars in debt? We're not in debt. The, the, it's federally funded. We have yes. a 20 million dollar shortfall. 20 million dollar shortfall for now. And I guarantee that it's going to grow. You know, and that's the thing is we even when we get these projects. We need, to, we need to do them within, within such a scope as they actually make sense for the city. Okay, and, and we're just going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. I apologize, but uh, that is all the time we have for tonight. You can learn more about what's happening in politics by visiting azpm.org. And while you're on the website, we'd love to hear your thoughts about tonight's program, so be sure to leave us a comment. Find out the latest from AZPM by following us on Facebook and Twitter. And you can stay tuned next for the news hour. And then at 8.30, tune into Arizona Week for an in-depth look at Arizona's economic forecast. Next week, Arizona Illustrated will begin a series of political forums with the candidates for state and federal office. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.